So it's my pleasure to introduce Ralph Schindler for today's talk. Uh, actually, this is going to be the first part of a two-part talk, the first part given by Ralph, and then next week, the second part by uh, David. And so uh, Ralph is going to speak about um, what he is writing on the whiteboard right now, namely that uh, the double plus version of Martin's maximum applies, implies uh, the axiom star. Okay. okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always very nice to be in New York. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this is joint work with David Aspero. Um, okay, and we, we decided and we, it was approved by the organizers that I will today kind of give an introduction to the whole thing and then next time next week David will give the actual proof um, and there are various ways how you might introduce this area um, I just decided to do it maybe a little bit differently to how one could do it um, I want to I want to do it in a way that we start with the observation that forcing so for a while, I'm not going to talk about Martin's maximum or star. So we will get there in a, in a moment. So forcing is a key technique in, in set theory, of course, if we all know, uh, as we all know. And you could just, you know, I, I want to kind of start as like as if it were an amusement. So you could just ask the question, um, suppose you have a statement which is consistent, can you force it? So which, which consistent, uh, yeah, this always happens. So let's see, which consistent statements can you force and of course the first which the first things which come to your mind is that there are a lot of things which are actually consistent and you cannot force i mean for instance uh, it's consistent that zf is not consistent right in, in in some sense and but you cannot force it or so more generally so this is a counter example So there are a lot of counter examples which immediately come to your mind. In fact, uh, you cannot change the theory, or not only the theory, I mean the forcing does not change the natural numbers, so you don't change the theory of the natural numbers. Okay, uh, if you move up a little bit, if you talk about reals, then um, it depends a little bit. I mean, there are statements uh, which are consistent and a little bit more interesting than what we just discussed from the point of view of set theorists. Namely, for instance, um, let's look at the statement, uh, every real is constructible. Or maybe every, let's be a little bit more liberal, every real is constructible from a given real from some real X. Every real is constructible. This is, this is a statement about the reals, um, which is, what is it, uh, pi one, pi one three, um, which you cannot force in general. You can force it if you, you can force it over the constructible universe, but once you have non-constructible reals, you are never gonna get rid of them. So you cannot force the statement. On the other hand, of course, it's consistent. If you, if you consider the statement every real is constructible from a given real X, then the answer is, well, sometimes you can force it, sometimes not. And by the way, when I say forcing, I always mean uh, set forcing. So for instance, when the universe is closed under sharps, you, there is no way you can force the statement that every real is constructible from one given real. On the other hand, if uh, there is a set which doesn't have a sharp, you can you can force that statement. So it, it depends. I mean, it's always consistent, but it depends on um, if you can force it or not. In the presence of large cardinals, the picture again changes completely. In that, if you if you assume that in V there are large cardinals, let's say a proper class of Woodin cardinals, then the theory of the reals uh, cannot be changed at all. 
or let's say in the presence of wooden cardinals, Well, you can you can of course add reels. You can um, the, the, the the reels can change, but the theory. And instead of talking about the reels, we could also as well talk about um, sets which are hereditarily countable. So look at this structure. The theory of this structure cannot be changed by forcing. So in some sense, we want to uh, work not only in ZFZ, but in, in a background theory, which is stronger than ZFC, which allows large cardinals because they have proven useful in set theory. So in, in, that, in that case, if we do that, um, we cannot change the theory of that model at all. And therefore the statement, uh, which consistent statements can be forces again, kind of void. And if we, when we move up, so, okay, now as a warning, I will always, I don't know how to scroll, so I will always have to simply erase what I just wrote. So if there's any question, if you have a question on concerning a given slide, you should ask it immediately. And in fact, I would encourage you to ask questions. It would, I would be very happy if you ask questions, but you should, you should not ask me later to go back to one of the earlier slides because it's impossible. <laughs> okay, so. Goodbye. Um, okay, so let's move up. So we just had as a structure, I mean, we were talking about the natural numbers. We were talking about the sets which are hereditarily countable. So the next maybe more complicated object you want to consider is the sets which are hereditarily of size um, at most Lf1. So that's this structure. And this because this is a very interesting structure and basically nothing we said so far applies to this structure. One difference of this structure to the earlier ones is that now the axiom of choice comes into play and this didn't happen before. So for instance, in this structure, uh, over this structure, you can define the non-stationary ideal on omega one, which will play also an important role in, in these two talks. And um, you know the, the properties of, of stationary sets. Um, if you prove things about stationary sets, you have to make serious use of the axiom of choice. And without the axiom of choice, many things are just false. And uh, a second issue, which which comes into play, right? I mean, this is kind of the CH aspect. Uh, sorry, the AC aspect. And the CH aspect is that this structure already decides the size of the continuum in that the continuum hypothesis is a sigma two, can be expressed in a sigma two way over the structure, right? So um, CH is sigma two over the structure. So you can express CH by saying that there is an enumeration of the reals in order type omega one. So there is something and then every real shows up in this enumeration. So this is sigma two over the structure. Okay, so these are new aspects. And um, okay, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, if we ask ourselves, so we already saw many statements and you, you will be able to think about more examples about counter examples of statements which are clearly so that uh, they are consistent in some way, but you cannot force them. So if we want to prove, if even for the structure H omega two, so if we want to prove something like if phi is consistent, then phi may be forced. Then in this sentence, consistent has to mean something more than consistent in the, in the regular sense, right? Usually we all know what consistency means, but if there should be any chance that something like that 
is actually a true statement. If he is consistent and if he may be forced, then consistent have to mean something more. And even that, that applies even to the level of H omega two, as we will see. Okay. So if you think about along these lines, uh, a concept never um, a concept naturally comes into play, which I guess was introduced by Hugh Woodin. This leads to omega logic. So omega logic spells out a stronger notion of consistency, which I will now turn to. And then the question um, whether if something is consistent in that stronger sense, can it then be forced actually makes sense? And this leads to an, a nice open question. And we will see a kind of partial answer uh, to, to this kind of question. Okay, so let me, let me introduce to you this stronger notion of consistency, which, um, um, which shows up in Omega logic. And I will define it slightly differently to how it is usually defined because I have later things in mind, okay? Okay, so what, what we want to do is we want a stronger concept of consistency. So for instance, if, as set theorists, uh, it's natural to say, okay, maybe a statement, um, you know, forcing doesn't change the, the natural numbers, and maybe uh, we only want to talk, we want to restrict the class of models, maybe we only want to consider models which only have the standard natural numbers, and um, okay, once you start this process, um, you, you quickly see how, how that such an approach should be generalized. So this leads to the following concepts. Uh, so let us, in the background, assume large cardinals. And as a matter of fact, a proper class of wooden cardinals will always be enough. Um, so let, let, let's suppose, so, so what I want to define is, I want to say, uh, okay, what, what does it mean to be consistent in a strong way? And in order to say that, I will have to talk about models which are closed under certain operators. And in order to do that, I will have to talk about uh, universally bare functions. So let F be a function. Let's say from the reals to the reals. Okay, um, we want to be able to say in a meaningful way what is the what is the version of such a function for instance in a forcing extension if this function has a natural has a has a simple definition for instance if it's borel it's it's clear to all of us what what the version of of that function in in a generic extension is you just run the definition in the extension right you would never kind of take the very same function then it may no longer be total and so on you, you want to run the definition and, and read it in the generic extension. Okay, so generalizing that, in order to have a version of that function in, a, in any generic extension, it suffices to have that this function is universally bare. So if you just consider it as a set, a subset of R cross R, then in every set generic extension, it has a its its new version, which is usually called F star. The new version of F in I mean, if you know, you, you fix a you fix a pose set. You go to, to the generic extension via P, and then you have a new version of this thing. And it may no longer be a function, but if you look, I mean, what is the, if you look at the statement which expresses the fact that uh, capital F is a function, it's something like uh, for every X, there is a Y, so that uh, Y is F of X. So this is a pi one two uh, statement. So the fact uh, F is a function, is pi one two in F, right? So for every X, there is a Y, blah, blah, blah. And in the presence of large cardinals, and if the function is universally bare, 
then this is an absolute statement. So you cannot change the, the truth value of this statement by forcing and therefore in a set generic extension of V, this is still true. So you will, so F star will be a function, okay? Can you repeat the definition of universally bare? Yeah, I didn't even, um, I didn't even state the definition of universally bare. So <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so the fact that F is universally bare, Uh, the, the, there are several equivalent definitions and the one which is easiest to work with for a set theorist is that you say that uh, F is given by the, as the projection of a tree. So the tree would be on, on here this is a function, so it's a subset of uh, R cross R. So it would be a tree on omega times omega times the ordinals. So F is the projection of this tree um, and you have another tree. So you have T and U, so F is the projection of T and for all four things, P, um, um, the, the projection of T is the complement of the projection of U. So the projection of U is always the complement of the projection of T. Okay. And then, so this is for all posets P. So this is the definition, what it makes something to be universally bare. <clears throat> and then what is the new version of F in a, set in, a, in a generic extension? It's just the projection of T in that extension. And you can prove that um, this new version is independent of the choice of the pair of trees T and U. So if I pick another, pair T prime and U prime, which has the very same properties. Uh, the projection of T prime is the same as the projection of T in any generic extension, so it's independent. So F star is kind of uniquely uh, determined. Um, okay. Sorry, just one clarifying question. Here, yes. T and U are, I mean, we're treating them as check names in the forcing language, right? It's not the reinterpretation of T or U or anything like this. There is no interpretation, uh, no reinterpretation of T and U. So T and U are trees on omega. I mean, here there is a, it's a function, so it's on omega times omega times the ordinals, and you really look, the, the trees are fixed. Right. Okay. What gets reinterpreted is that F star. If you force, you go to a set, you go to a generic extension of E. F star is the projection of T in the bigger model. I mean, one shouldn't write F star, maybe one should write something like F to the P or something. I don't know, there are several notations around. Okay. This is the natural new version of a set in the generic extension. Okay. Okay. Um, then there is another feature. Mm, how should I deal with this now? Can I erase this part? Um, there is also, under favorable circumstances, you can also extend such a function or, or such a function can induce a function from HC to HC, in fact, from all of V to V, or in fact, from VP to VP, if it's, um, it's, if it's doing some kind of coding for you. So we can say that F is code invariant If basically what you want to have is that if you have two reals, X and Y, and they code the same thing, you know, take any, take your favorite device via which you can code elements of HC by reals, right? Okay, so, and then we could say, suppose for any two reals, if they code the same thing, which I will denote as X is isomorphic to X prime, if they code the same thing, then f of x codes the same thing as f of x prime, okay? And if that, that's again a pi one two statement in f, so this is again uh, true in every uh, generic extension. And then you can very easily prove that now you can extend 
or extend maybe is the slightly wrong word, f induces in a natural way a function from the universe to the universe. In fact, f induces, uh, let me call it, I don't know, f bar going from vp to vp. Uh, for any p. It's because you can collapse anything to become a member of HC, is that yes, the idea? Yes, exactly. Okay. So, so take, your, take your favorite object in VP, it may be uncountable, but there is a further collapse where you make it countable. You know that um, because of this, um, by absoluteness, that in this, in, this, in this collapse extension of V, so you code this object by a real, and then the, the new version of the function is defined for that real, so it gets an output. And you know that it's, the output is, you know, it's kind of independent of um, uh, the, the output, what it codes is independent of which code you, you used. And then by, um, um, well, and then, then you have to show that actually the output is, uh, if, if the input was in VP, then the output is in VP. This is by a mutual genericity argument. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is a this is a nice exercise that there is exactly one way such a function capital F can induce an F bar in a very natural way. So, what what are examples? So, for instance, um, if you come from inner model theory, um, sharps are a, a, a natural example. So, uh, the sharp of a real may be coded by a real. So the function which takes a real x and maps it to x sharp, this can be construed as a function uh, from the reals to the reals. And now, in, and under assuming large cardinals, you have exactly these hypotheses. So this is, uh, there is the, the natural function which, which codes the sharp function is, is code invariant and everything. And, and if you do this procedure, what you really get is um, that your f bar would be exactly the function which takes an object x and maps it to X sharp. It's just an abstract version of, of such a phenomenon, right? So the F bar could be the function which takes, takes an object X, even could be even uncountable and maps it to X sharp, or it could be an X and, and you map it to M1 sharp or, or one of these operators from inner model theory, okay? <clears throat> okay, so for a, for a sufficiently nice function from the reals to the reals, uh, such a function, and, and by, by that we, you know, informally speaking, we could say it's a function which is sort of definable. If you have such a function, you induce a function f bar uh, from vp to vp, and then we may define uh, what it means to be f closed. Okay, the, the advantage, if we, usually when you do omega logic, you don't do it that way, but our advantage is that um, now we can talk about models which are f closed for a given f even if um, even if the models uh, are uncountable even if the models exist outside of v and so on right so and that's in, in fact what we are going to do in, in a second right i can talk about a model to be f closed um, even if the model is outside of v and is uncountable right because i have this extension property to this f bar Okay, uh, wait. Okay, so we say, uh, let's say transitive model M. Okay, all our models which we will actually consider exist in some generic extension of V. That's without loss of generality, some theta. Uh, is called F closed if, well, you are in V, in, in this generic extension of V, and there you have this induced function, which I called F bar on the previous slide. So we simply say that uh, F bar, you know, just this thing, right? So the so M is closed under the induced function F bar. So in the case of, for instance, if the original F coded the sharp function, then this just means that M is closed on the sharps. Okay, and then the strong form of consistency <coughs> we, 
which we want to consider is that we say that phi is omega consistent and that coincides with um, the definition Wooden gave for this, except for that we formulated differently for future purposes. If for every f as above, you know, I'm assuming that it's universally bare and it has these properties that these two pi one two statements are true, right? Um, it's it's well, it is a function, so it is total. That's automatic, but also it's code invariant. Um, there is an f closed model. Here the M could be countable. In a second, we will consider models which are no longer countable. Um, so that M is a model of phi. So for this definition, you don't have to step outside of V. If, if outside of V, there is such an M for a given F, then in V by absoluteness, there is such an, such an M. So you don't have to step outside. Later, we will consider uh, statements which are omega consistent where we actually have to step out. Um, Okay, so um, this leads to the, this, this allows a precise formulation of a version of the question we raised in the very beginning. And this is the omega conjecture. Uh, well, it's formulated as a conjecture. So it says that if phi, okay, the omega conjecture, I think only talks about local statements. So it talks about statements which are sigma two the statement is sigma two if you can verify it in a rank initial segment of the universe, right? So if phi is sigma two and phi is omega consistent, then phi may be forced. Okay, and even for H omega two, I think in generality it is, it is still open, but we will turn to a version of um, of the omega conjecture, which we actually know how to prove. And this er came out of the solution of the question whether mm double plus implies star. Okay, so I will now turn to some kind of um, special case. If you want, I mean, it's, it's kind of, a, it's a little bit dual to the omega conjecture what we will now turn to. So we will prove something we are able to prove something which is neither weaker or stronger than the omega conjecture. It's a little bit orthogonal to it. So you will see in a second. Okay. Is there, by the way, any question so far or am I too, is it? Okay. So, so far we, um, we started out with a question, uh, if something's consistent, can you force it? Well, this question by itself, if consistent means the usual thing is just stupid, it's just wrong. So then we, we looked at kind of examples in rank initial segments of the universe. And now we cooked up this stronger notion of consistency. And then it starts that now the question actually makes sense. So this is a reasonable question. It holds true in a lot of inner models. Um, it is, it is true in L, it is true in all the known canonical inner models, uh, but it's not known if it's true in general and it, 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 it's not, there is no counterexample, no. Okay, so this is an interesting um, uh, question in the kind of pure theory of forcing, if you want. Now we turn to, a, to this kind of orthogonal question. And in order to formulate that, um, so we had this notion of omega consistency. We need a, a kind of a, a different notion, which uh, namely honest consistency. Consistent, which will play a role in the results we are about to present. Okay, so when is, it's, it's very similar to omega consistent, okay? So you have a statement phi. Now, the language, so far the language was the language of set theory. So let me write the language of set theory by L sub epsilon. Now let's enrich the language uh, by adding a predicate for the non-stationary ideal, which was already mentioned, the non-stationary ideal on omega one. So 
so you have a predicate for that. So a formula in that language, so I should say, um, of course, if when we force, the meaning of the non-stationary ideal will change, but we will be particularly interested in forcings which don't change stationary sets. And such a forcing, what it does is that the new version of the non-stationary ideal uh, restricted to the ground model is just the ground model non-stationary ideal. Okay, so this is uh, what we will be interested in. So we say that such a statement phi is honestly consistent if for all f as above, so universally bare and code invariant, uh, maybe I should write it down, universally bare and code invariant, There is a model A. Now this is a transitive model, but A no longer need to exist in V. It is allowed to exist in a generic extension of V. But as we discussed, it makes sense to say that it's closed under F. And I think we should say that the power set of omega one of V is contained in A, otherwise the next line doesn't really make sense. I want to, I want to have that um, the non-stationary ideal from the point of view of A restricted to the ground model V is just, is just V. So the non-stationary ideal of A intersect V is the non-stationary ideal of, so, so it looks a little bit like A is a stationary set preserving extension of V, but it's not an extension because it's a, it's a set. It exists in a generic extension, but it exists somewhere where you, you, where you are allowed to collapse omega one and, and other cardinals. But by itself, it does not kill any stationary sets. Okay. And the last item of course is that A is a model of phi. Okay. So phi is honestly consistent if somewhere out, if for every F, you know, somebody gives you an F, a challenge F, and so you are able to find somewhere outside of V, a transitive F closed model, uh, which does not kill stationary sets of, of V and which is a model of V, okay? So, and now we can, may turn to the version of the, kind of version of the Omega conjecture, which we were actually able to prove So we have the following theorem. You need a little bit of large cardinals, but actually not very much in the presence of large cardinals. I mean, without any large cardinals, all these things don't really make sense because there aren't it may just be that there aren't that many universally bare sets and then everything goes wrong. Um, so a proper class of wooden cardinals is more than enough we need for the theorem. And I think um, if you look carefully for this particular theorem, having that the universe is closed under the M1 sharp operation is, is enough. But let's, let's just think, e.g. a proper class of woodens. And then you can just say if phi is honestly consistent, uh, just one second, I have to, uh, well, <laughs> this is not what I want to say. I'm sorry. Um, Now I'm allowing uh, parameters in the statement phi. So for one thing, phi is sigma one. In this language, L, where you have also this symbol for the non-stationary ideal. If A is an element of H omega two. So when we define honest consistency, so you can think of A as a subset of omega one, right? 
And when we, when we define honest consistency, we said there has to be for every F, there has to be this model curly A, which is a model of phi. So we could have that phi has a, has a parameter uh, like this A here, right? Because we require that the, that the model has all the subsets of omega one as elements, or in other words, that H omega two of V is a, is a sub collection of, of this model. So we can carry along this, this A as a predicate in our statement. And this is what we are gonna do here. Um, so if, if this statement is honestly consistent, honest, then there is a stationary set preserving forcing P such that uh, in V of P, the statement holds true. Okay, and you can actually add a little bit more. You could also add a set B or let's call it D, which is universally bare. So this is a universally bare set. So gamma infinity is the collection of universally bare sets of reals. Then you can have that as a um, as a parameter also in your statement. So you could say if phi of A and D is honestly consistent, what does that mean, right? I mean, this D in every set generic extension has its own version. So that means that you have this model for every F, uh, you have this model which is F closed and in which phi of A and the new version of D holds true which makes sense because the model is supposed to exist in a, in a generic extension of V, then you can actually uh, force the statement. So there is, a, there is a D here. And if you want to be very precise, I should write the new version of D here. And maybe I should also write a D star here, but uh, well, I hope you, it's, uh, it's clear what I mean, okay. Okay, so here, here is an answer. Here is, as it turns out, an interesting answer to a version of the question. Suppose something is consistent, can you force it? And here the answer is yes, under very specific circumstances, uh, you can do that. And what's, what's the point of this whole thing? <clears throat> Let me introduce. Um, uh, Oops. So now we turn to forcing axioms and, and star. So let me introduce the following forcing axiom, bounded Martin's maximum star plus plus is the following statement. So if phi is sigma one in the language for set theory with a predicate for the non-stationary ideal, and A is basically a subset of omega one and uh, phi of A is honestly consistent. Then that's the conclusion. Then phi of A is true. And a strengthening of that is something that's, that's uh, it looks like it's a very weird uh, statement. We will see in a second what's going on here. So gamma here is a collection of sets of reals which are all universally bare. So they all have uh, versions of themselves in generic extensions. So gamma BMM star plus plus is the statement if phi is a sigma one sentence in that language, A is a, a, is a parameter and D is in gamma and phi of A and D is honestly consistent, then this statement is actually true. So that is a definition. And now we have the following theorem. <coughs> So I should say that this theorem 
uh, at least what I'm going to write on first is, is much older than the result on the previous slide, but then I will add a line um, which, which is the new feature. So the following, in the presence of large cardinals, and again, a proper class of Boolean cardinals is more than enough, in the presence of large cardinals, the following statements are equivalent. Uh, the first one is star. I didn't tell you what star is. I will um, try to do that now even though I'm extremely amazed by how fast the time passes by. Um, and the second statement is simply, uh, we take as gamma the sets of reals which exist in L of R, the smallest inner model which has all the reals. Okay, so the power set of, the set of reals which exists in L of R, this is our gamma, BMM star, this is a very ugly uh, notation, but this is how it is. Um, okay. Um, now the the third item I could write here is that because we saw that if something is honestly consistent and if it, of the right type of of statement, then we can actually force it. <clears throat> so in the presence of the theorem from the last slide it's immediately clear that bounded Martin's maximum star plus plus is simply equivalent to the unstarred version of bounded Martin's maximum. Okay, so what, what is the statement in the last line here? What is the statement C? Um, I can write it down up here. So gamma, BMM double plus is simply the statement, it's the same statement. And instead of assuming that you are honestly consistent, you assume the apparently weaker fact that it's forcible by a um, stationary set preserving forcing. Set preserving forcing. But uh, in the presence of the theorem from the last slide, this is actually the same. So you're, if you're honestly consistent, then you're forcible by a stationary set preserving forcing. So the two statements are actually the same. Um, so B and C are equivalent by the previous slide. And then it turns out they are both equivalent to this axiom star, which was introduced by Hugh Woodin. Uh, so let me ask, I'm basically out of time, right? How, how, how do you do it? No, no, you can, you can take more time if you want. Like we, we usually, uh, like if you want to have another half hour, that's fine too. So oh you don't God. have to feel. Is it, is it true? Is it true? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. You don't have yeah. to feel any time pressure. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not Sorry. checking how. Sorry? We are very informal about time, so. Okay. So whoever wants to drop out should feel free to drop out. I'm not, I'm not checking uh, who is still here. I, I'm not controlling. I'm just focused on my thing. You can all. <laughs> um, while we are actually uh, interrupting, uh, can, I, can I just ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Okay. So, um, so I was wondering, is there um, in the definition of honestly consistent and omega consistent, would it make sense to look at local versions that, say, that require that the model that witnesses the consistency is closed under some particular F that you have in mind? Like, are there like local versions of the whole thing somehow depending on the function under which you're uh, closed? It's probably a bit subtle. I mean, it turns out um, it turns out actually, you know, I'm, I don't know if you want to call it cheating. Um, when you prove, when you prove that if something is honestly, when you prove that is, if a sigma one statement is honestly consistent, then you can force it. The only models are, which are actually relevant proving honest consistency are models which are closed under M1 sharp. So I could, I could actually, for our purpose, I could actually honest, consistent define as saying 
the statement is honest consistent if it's true in a model which is closed under the M1 sharp operator. Uh, that, that, okay, mm -hmm. but, but this is kind of a special artifact of sigma one statements. So if you look at more complicated statements, or in particular, if you look at arbitrary sigma two statements, you know, no longer local restricted to the structure H omega two, but just global, I mean, you know, statement would talk about a larger rank initial segment of the universe, then, then the picture completely changes. So for instance, when you prove the omega conjecture in, in L of E models, in canonical inner models, it's very important that you have the full power of um, omega consistency as your hypothesis. Uh, so yeah, um, I don't think people look at that, so there might be something. Yeah, it, it, might, it might be a little bit subtle, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and another question that, that I also had. Um, so, like you're adding this uh, predicate for the non-stationary ideal. Like, would it be possible to, or would it make sense somehow to add a predicate for the function under which you want to be closed in some sense? You know what I'm saying? Like uh, that you that yeah, you yeah. automatically only can uh, witness this thing by a model that has to be closed under the particular function you're interested in. Yeah, but yeah, okay. Uh, Maybe it's just a different way of saying. Uh, saying yeah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, probably you could. I mean, probably not in a sigma one way, right? I mean, you couldn't say in a sigma one way that you couldn't have a sigma one statement so that if the model thinks the sigma one statement, then it's automatically closed under your under the operation you're interested in. No, exactly. That's why I meant you could yeah. add the predicate that expresses this operation or something like that. So that to make it expressible. But even if you add it as a predicate, how, how do you say in a sigma one way that you're closed under? Being closed oh. is always, it looks more like pi two, right? Sure. Yeah, okay. So for sigma oh. one, it probably oh. doesn't work, but yeah. Probably, okay. okay. But yeah, you are right. Probably if, if you look at more complicated statements, then the picture might change, yeah. Mm -hmm. So All here right. we, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And questions are always welcome, of course. So it just turns out that, um, so the, you know, the, the story is kind of that the that the full omega conjecture is still open, as we just saw. There are probably a lot of variants of this whole of this of these kinds of questions. So somehow the full omega conjecture is at the one end of the extreme and the question we can actually answer is at the other end of an extreme where we really only consider sigma one statements. If you think about it, sigma one statements are not that powerful, but they can say something. <laughs> okay, so it's kind of, um, and the reason why we look at sigma one here is that, well, it just helps to prove the theorem, which is here at the bottom of the, uh, of these slides. So um, basically, David next time will prove this theorem or rather the, the theorem from the pre previous slide. He will basically, yeah. Um, so I should say, I should tell you what, what star is. Um, and then I was actually planning to sketch a proof of why A and B. I'm not going into proving that B and C or A and C are equivalent. Um, but I, want to, I wanted to tell you the proof why A and B are equivalent as a, as a warm up for what is to come next week. And as I said, if, if you get tired, feel free to drop out. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so Okay, so if you never saw star before, then it's probably gonna be a bit tough to kind of swallow or to appreciate what it actually means. Um, it has a long history, but I cannot get into that. So there is a forcing which is called Pmax, introduced by Hugh Woodin. So Pmax consists of countable structures so these are models M. So this is countable and transitive. In the presence of large cardinals, we can simply say that they are models of, of ZFZ. 
usually you also want to say the involves of Martin's axiom, but countable. Um, there is a distinguished predicate associated with these models I. So uh, from the point of view of the model, this is a normal ideal on omega one. And there is also a, in order to kind of control the whole thing, um, there is an A around, which is a subset of omega one of P and it's an element of, of P, okay, or M. Yeah, I, I could write. Uh, so the omega one here is of course the omega one of M and this is the omega one of M again, okay. So uh, Pmax consists of, <clears throat> of such structures. Um, so the structure thinks that I is a normal ideal on omega one. And what you want in addition is the following. You want to be able to generically iterate these structures. What does that mean? If you have an ideal on, on, on anything, let's say we have an ideal on omega one, we can force with the positive sets of the ideals and that will give us an M ultra filter in this case. So we can take by, when we, when we force with the positive sets, we get an ultra filter and we can take the ultra power of M by that ultra filter and we get an elementary embedding from M into that ultra power. <clears throat> so we require that ultra power to be well-founded, but then by elementarity, you're kind of back with the same situation. So you're back with a structure of the same type. So what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to repeat that process. So now you want to say, no matter how I force over the new structure and I take a generic alpha power as it's called, I again only want to get well-founded uh, ultra powers. Okay, so generically iterable means I start out with the original structure. I take my favorite generic alpha power. So I force with the positive sets, I get this alpha. So I get a structure M1 with a new structure on it. And then I force with a new version of the ideal with the image of I. And I pick my favorite generic here and I get an M2. And at limit stages, I take direct limits and so on. So gen generic iterability means that no matter how I pick my generics along the way, I never run into ill-founded structures. And I, I want to be able to do that um, as long as I find generics by what I mean that as long as my structures are countable. You know, as, as long as the structure is countable, you can force over them, you can pick in V a generic, you can take the generic alter power and so on. So that is what generic iterability means. And you say that one structure like that, so if, if P and Q, are both in Pmax, you want to say that Q is stronger than P. <clears throat> if Q can see an iteration of P which kind of matches things up, okay? So if, if Q, okay, let me write, uh, okay, Q, Q is a model, right? I mean, it looks a bit, uh, Q can see, an iteration P goes to P star of P. So let's write P star as there is this model, the underlying model. There is an I here. There is this thing here. So Q, let me also write it. Um, maybe I should write it here. Q is equal to Q epsilon I and A, okay, Q can see such an iteration of P uh, in a way that um, the A's match up. So A is equal to A star and the ideal I star is simply the ideal I restricted to the structure P star, okay. Um, okay. Now the question is, what is this all about? So this is a forcing. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
which arose out of a proof, I guess, by Steele and Van Bessel, where they showed that delta 1, 2 is LF2 is consistent with large cardinals in ZFZ. So this was a forcing which was over a deterministic model and then uh, he wouldn't refine the whole method and eventually he cooked up this forcing. So it turns out that this is a forcing uh, which works very well if you force over a deterministic model with it. And that's it's very important for the analysis of this forcing that you have one specific consequence of deterministic in order for, to make things work out nicely or to, to produce interesting statements in the generic extension. So you assume that you have a model of determinacy, you force over the model of determinacy with Pmax forcing, and then in the extension you have uh, interesting statements. So this, this is the introduction of, this is a crash course in Pmax forcing. So what is, what is the axiom of star? What, what is the axiom star? Star is trivially true in a Pmax extension of L of R or a bigger determinacy model because star says the following. So star is the following statement. Uh, it's a conjunction of two statements. We always work in the presence of large cardinals. So in some sense, the first uh, statement is kind of automatic if you assume large cardinals in the universe. It says that the axiom of determinacy holds true in the least inner model which contains all the reals. And you want to say that there is a filter or a, yeah, a filter G in Pmax, uh, which is L of R generic. So it meets all the dense sets in L of R and has the additional feature that it captures the power set of omega one. So the power set of omega one is contained in the Pmax extension of L of R as being given by that filter. Okay. So having a, a generic filter over L of R is not, not enough. You also want that all the subsets of omega one are contained in the Pmax extension of L of R by that filter. So it's a, basically a conjunction of, of these statements. And so, as I said, if you force with Pmax over L of R and you assume that AD holds true in L of R to begin with, otherwise Pmax doesn't really do what it is ought to, uh, then you will automatically have the statement, right? Because you forced, you have this filter, it is L of R generic, and of course everything, the, the generic extension is L of R G. So, but if you if you look at the statement if you look at the statement star from the point of view of V, where you didn't do any forcing, it's just a statement about V. Read it as a statement about V, then it's highly non-trivial. Why should there be such a filter which is generic over L of R? Why should the filter have the property that it captures all the subsets of omega one in in that sense, right? Okay, so if you remember the statement from before, um, the theorem which I wrote down was that, uh, recall, right, this theorem, uh, the second theorem with David Aspro was that uh, in the presence of large cardinals, the following are equivalent, star, and the second item, I guess, was that you have gamma, bound in Martin's maximum star plus plus. <clears throat> so they are equivalent. And okay, I should say at this point that the third item which will be discussed next time is that you have the same thing here, but you leave out the star. So it's the kind of classical forcing axiom that this last item is implied by the strong forcing axiom which shows up in my title, I guess, and this is MM. So it implies the statement. So this is Martin's maximum. So the, the usual um, or the classical formulation of Martin's maximum um, is different to the formulations we had given. Classically, what you say is Martin's maximum is the statement that if you have a forcing which preserves stationary subsets of omega one, and you have a collection of at most out of one many dense sets, 
Then there is a filter in V which meets all these ten sets. Uh, the plus plus version of Martin's maximum says that if you have a stationary set preserving forcing and you're given a collection of at most LF1 many dense sets and you are given a collection of LF1 many names for stationary subsets of omega 1, then there is a filter which meets all these dense sets and which interprets any of these LF1 many names for stationary subsets of omega 1 as truly, as, as truly stationary subsets of omega 1. This is the classical formulation. You can reformulate that along the lines. Uh, we said it and it, it, it implies the, um, the bounded, the, the version, it implies what, what we had defined as being bounded Martin's maximum double plus uh, for gamma being the sets of reals in L of R. Um, Okay, um, let me finish, yeah, let, let's, let's do it as follows. Um, so as the consequence of this whole thing is, uh, as a consequence, we have that Martin's maximum double plus implies star, which was the first line, I, which was kind of the title of my talk, I think. Um, you can do it that way. So let, let us, let me sketch a proof of the following. So the, um, it's a PMAX argument to show that in the presence of, of mild large cardinals, star implies um, the second line here and therefore also the third because the second trivially implies the third. Um, this was proven by Woodin and uh, I think it's in the book on PMAX forcing. Uh, the other direction, let me sketch the argument as a final thing. We didn't do many proofs yet, so let me, um, let me sketch a proof of that, okay? Okay, so let, let me, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so sketch of, looks like you have to remember everything I said so far in order to uh, BMM star plus plus implies star but I, I will tell you uh, can you actually read it I cannot because it's under my uh, so I, I sketched the proof of this direction right that this particular form the star version of bounded Martin's maximum implies star. And if you, if you forgot what this bounded version of BMM means, I will tell you in a second. Um, okay, and I will of course not really prove the theorem, but I will tell you what we have to do. Okay, so we have to, the, the first step, you wanna verify star. So you wanna write down a, a candidate for the generic filter and it turns out, if you think about it, there is exactly one candidate. There is only one possibility, okay? Modulo, um, you know, these Pmax conditions, they come with, with these designated uh, subsets of omega-1. So you have to fix in a subset of omega-1 to begin with. So let, so we fix an A and uh, you should, it should compute um, the cardinal LF1 correctly. Okay, and then from that you define what turns out to be a filter under mild hypothesis. It's not, a, it's not that in ZFZ it's a filter, but if you assume a little bit, then it turns out to be a Pmax filter. So you take all the Pmax conditions, uh, which admit there is an omega one long iteration, which takes P, I mean, generic iteration, right? generic iteration, which takes P and maps it to P star. So let's write P star as P star epsilon, I, the ideal and the A, oops, such that um, 
I is simply the restriction of the true non-stationary ideal of V to the iterate. Okay, and A is simply capital A. It's the capital A from, from up here. Okay, so it turns out that um, GA is a filter. Basically, you know, why, for instance, are any two uh, conditions in that G sub A compatible? Well, what do you have to do with, with you know, you, you need one condition, you, you take two conditions and now you need one which is stronger than both of them. Well, basically the condition you might look at is H omega two comma epsilon comma the non-stationary ideal of B comma capital A. Well, that's kind of a condition on, on, on unless it's not countable. But you can take a scolem hull and make it something, uh, make it make it countable. Okay, so there is this kind of big master condition. Yeah. Uh, Ralph, uh, could I just ask, I, I have to admit, I don't know much about Pmax at all. I no. forgot everything, but uh, so no. um, can it add reals? No, right? No, Pmax is sigma closed, so it doesn't right. add reals. Yes. Okay, so there is no ambiguity about what Pmax is uh, between the forcing extension and the ground model. Uh, the forcing extension and the ground model. You want to? No, I'm just saying because, uh, like you, uh, like the way Star is formulated, it says essentially something like that: the forcing extension uh, that the V is like a forcing extension of oh, L of R. But uh, but so oh, the ground model would have the same version of Pmax. Uh, That's actually if, true. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, okay. It's a it's a pi one two set. And also the yeah everything is very easily definable so it's absolute yes uh -huh. okay yes okay. yes that's true mm -hmm. but yeah that's a good point okay so this G A is a filter and also if G A happens to be L of R generic I mean it's a filter in P max. Uh, then there is another uh, argument. Um, for instance, if you assume that the non-stationary ideal of omega one is saturated, then it's very easy, and and there are large cardinals above. Then um, the power set of omega one is contained in the Pmax extension of L of R by this generic filter. So what we are left with having to do is uh, have to prove, uh, so it remains to show that GA is L of R generic uh, in order to verify star. Okay. And in order to do that, so what does, what does that mean, right? I mean, that, that simply means that uh, you give me a, let's say, open then set in Pmax, which is an element of L of R, and I have to convince you that uh, it has not empty intersection with G sub A, right? So fix, uh, how do I want to call it, a B in L of R, open dense in Pmax, uh, and we need to see that B intersect um, G sub A is not empty. Now let's let's take a look at this statement at the kind of as logicians, right? What what is the kind of complexity of this statement? Okay. Uh, you know, if you unravel, it says there is a condition which admits an omega, long, omega one long iteration producing what's, what's written up there in the definition of G sub A, so that this condition is an element of, of B, right? So this, this is a statement which is sigma one in the language where you have a predicate for the non-stationary ideal available and a predicate for the set B. I mean, B is basically a set of reals. It can be in a canonical fashion be coded by a set of reals. So, so this statement 
is sigma one in what are the um, what are what are the um, parameters? Right, one parameter is certainly a. Uh, it's sigma one in this language where you have a predicate for the non-stationary ideal around. Okay, I should write it differently. I should write it down as I as I wrote it before. Sigma one in the language where you have the predicate for the non-stationary ideal and the parameters are A and B. Okay. Okay, so so let me let me try to let me try again to convince you that this is true. So B intersect G of A non-empty. That means that there is a condition which is in G sub A. That means there is a condition together with an omega one long iteration of it. So that if, if you look at the last iterate, its ideal is the restriction of the non-stationary ideal of B to that iterate and A is A, okay? So, so far, this is certainly a statement which is sigma one in, in that language where you have a predicate for the non-stationary ideal available. And then you also just say that this condition which you found in G of A is in B, and this is just another, you, uh, you know, you make reference to B and that's it. Okay, so this is exactly, so now you know why I was obsessed so much with sigma one formulas in that language, because here is a statement which is exactly um, uh, one of these sentences which we talked about it before, okay? And therefore, because it has this complexity, this statement which we want to prove, it suffices if we, um, um, if we are allowed to use this form of bounded Martin's maximum, it suffices to verify that it's honestly consistent that this statement holds true, okay? And then next week, we will actually see that we can actually force it. And the fact that it's honestly consistent is a, is a kind of starting point. And from that, we will actually be able to, to cook up a forcing which actually forces the existence of this thing. Okay, but anyway, under, bounded Martin's maximum star plus plus in order to show um, the last line on the slide, it's enough to verify that this statement is honestly consistent. Okay. Okay. So, um, so by, you know, by, by this BMM star plus plus, and there was this, you know, the power set of reals in L of R. Uh, we assume that it's enough to show that B intersect G A non-empty is honestly consistent. But of course, you don't stare at this statement, but, but you look at the sigma one statement in this language, uh, you know, as, as we just spelled it out, right? Okay. Okay, so let me finish by giving a very rude sketch. Is, it, is rude the word? A very rough <laughs> uh, sketch of the, <laughs> of the argument why this is honestly consistent. And the way it works is as follows. And, um, it turns out that the argument to follow is actually a proof that the forcing, which will be defined next time, is non empty. Uh, but I don't tell you what the forcing is, so this is kind of. Okay, so how, do, how does the argument go? Okay, why, why is that honestly consistent? Okay, we start out with the following structure. So I will, I will just draw one picture in order to convince you that this is honestly consistent, and then, then, then I'm done. Okay, so let's look at the following structure. You take h omega two of v epsilon, the non-stationary ideal on omega one of v, and our a. We fix this uh, subset of omega one, which computes omega one correctly, uh, because the non-stationary ideal. Well, we assume the non-stationary ideal is saturated, so this is a very nice structure. It can see all the anti-chains in the non-stationary ideal among the positive sets. Uh, okay, so this is like almost a p-max condition, except for that it's not countable but let's make it countable. So let's step into a universe where this is countable. So let's collapse. So let's, let's work in here. So in there, this is a Pmax condition. Okay. Uh, and it is kind of a, 
rank initial segment or how do you call it of, of the it's an element of the anyway so this is a condition now right okay so now our b in the background we assume a little bit of large cardinals right so in particular we assume that projective statements about b are absolute so b was assumed to be a um a, an open dense set so uh, i guess this is a, like a pi one two in b statement that it's open dense so in the in our current generic extension where we collapsed omega two to become countable, um, the new version of B is is um, is an open dense set. So we may actually find a condition which is stronger than P, call it Q, which is in the new version of B, and this Q is stronger than P, right? So if I draw a picture, so we find a Q in B star. And Q can see an iteration of P, a generic iteration of P, to some, let's call it P alpha, where the alpha is actually the omega one of Q, and all of that is in here, and P alpha and Q match up in the way as defined uh, when, we, when we defined when something is, is stronger, right? So what I want is that this is stronger than this thing, okay? So the, the non-stationary ideal of P alpha is just a restriction of the distinguished ideal of Q and the A got mapped to something which is the A of, of Q. Okay, so this is the thing. And now what we want to do is we want to iterate a little bit further. Uh, what we want to do is that we want to iterate. This is a P max condition in our current universe. So let's just iterate it so this is something countable. So let's iterate it omega one steps, omega one from the point of view of, of this uh, collapse extension of V. So the, the new omega one is the old omega three. Okay, so basically we iterated omega three steps to some Q star. Um, Q can see the iteration from P to P alpha. So we may just look at the image under the map from Q to Q star of the map from p to p alpha and this gives a map from p to something which i will call p star and it just has the iteration from p to p alpha as a in as an initial segment okay so the iteration from p to p star is the image under the map from q to q star of that iteration which witnesses that q is stronger than p so that is the picture and um, the rest of the picture is that downstairs from p to p alpha and then to p star this is a generic iteration of p and we may put all of v on top of that iteration so h omega 2 of v is an initial segment of v and the iteration here lifts to an iteration of v to a model let's call it m so that uh, p star is uh an element of m in fact what is p star right um, p star is has the same definition in m as the original p has in, in v right it's the h omega 2 of m comma epsilon comma the non-stationary ideal of omega 1 of m and then there is some i don't know if this is i there is an i of a here okay it's a stretched version of a okay um okay now um okay so 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 this is our this is our current picture right um we can also oh yeah i forgot to say and we can also do it that's what i wanted to say we can do this iteration up here in a way that um you know there is this distinguished ideal of q by which and its images we do this iteration up here, we can arrange that when we do the iteration from Q to Q star, that all the positive sets of Q star will actually be truly stationary in V call omega omega two. So all the all the positive sets positive in the sense of the ideal, the distinguished ideal of Q star are stationary in our current universe where we do this whole thing, business, 
אוקיי. אוקיי. אוקיי, now we are basically done. Why are we basically done? Um, there is a model which is external to M, right? You, you have this inner model M, it's transitive. It's an inner model. So it has as an external model, this is not a forcing extension of M. But it's as close as you want it to be, right? This is, this is one key point. So, um, when, you know, when, whenever you're given some universally bare F, uh, the call extension of V is closed under that. Okay, fine. So, so this, is a, this, this is a very close model. Also, um, it does not kill any stationary sets, right? By what I just wrote down. The iteration I does not, um, has the property that the I, I Q star positive sets, they are truly stationary. Uh, so, this, so the positive sets of P star are all stationary in M. Uh, and therefore, well, if you take it, put it together, um, if something is stationary in M, then it's uh, stationary in the outer model V called omega omega two. Okay, but also the, this collapse extension of V, well, it can see a condition, namely Q. I mean, this this extension of V sees everything, so it sees a condition Q, which is in B star. Okay. And therefore, if you think of B star as being given, after all, these sets are in L of R, so they are also universally bare. Um, if you think of it as being given uh, by a tree, so projection of T, so you have an I bar down here. So this Q, because it's in the projection of T, it's also in the projection of the shifted tree I bar of T, okay? Okay, and then you say the following. By absoluteness, because there is this outer model to M, which now can see everything we want to have, right? By absoluteness, there will be in a forcing extension of M, there will be a model A, which is as close as you want, which has a condition Q, which is in the projection of I bar of T of the shifted tree, okay? And this, um, and this model A does not kill any stationary sets, and it is, as we said, as close as, as you want. And now you just move back that statement uh, by the elementarity of the map from V to M, you can move back that statement. So a generic extension of V will see a model which is as close as you want, so that the model thinks that there is a Q uh, which has an iteration as as we want to verify that it's in, in the version of G sub A, and the, the condition is also in the original projection of, of T, okay? So by drawing this picture, you can first see that um, M has this outer model which can see everything as we want to have it. Then by absoluteness, a generic extension of M will have such a model and then you pull it back. And this, this way you verify that it's honestly consistent uh, to have uh, such a condition which witnesses that B intersect G sub A is not empty and now you will have to force it. Uh, if you look at it, we did not get this condition in a forcing extension, right? Because basically because um, V call omega omega two is not a forcing extension of M. It's kind of completely external. That's a problem. And this is why this argument does not immediately give you uh, that in a forcing extension, the new version of B intersect the new version of G sub A is not empty. So you have to do some additional work and it was quite some work. Okay. Okay, so this was a sketch of this argument and um, this is kind of part of what is to come uh, in the full proof. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the interesting okay. talk. <laughs> Um, so are there, are there further questions? I mean, we did ask some questions already during the talk, but, um, now is the time. <laughs> okay. I don't Probably think there are any be. further questions. <laughs> the obvious question would be, can you please repeat what you said? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh.
uh, yeah, it is probably if you, if you didn't see a star in PMEX before, and uh, then it's probably okay. Anyway, um, no, I think it was a very good idea to give like an overview. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Uh -huh. All right. Great. So thanks again. And, okay. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to the to part two next week. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so, have a good day.